We're starting a new sermon series called Arrows. And what we're going to be looking at over the next couple weeks is what kind of life does God want us to live? What is our aim? What is our goal? What does it mean to live as Christ? What does that even look like? And so if you can imagine Paul writing to the church at Philippi, he's talked a lot about himself and how he's lived his life and the things that he's going through and the suffering that he's doing, and yet his main concern is advancing the gospel. But now it's as if he's turning the page and he's looking at the church at Philippi and the life that they're living and how they're going to experience persecution and what kind of lifestyle he wants them to adopt. And really the main target, the big goal, is to live like Jesus. You know, when I was younger, we, uh, I grew up in a gaming household, not necessarily video games, even though uh, we played Super Nintendo, greatest gaming system of all time, and then the Nintendo 64, Addicted. You guys remember 007 when that first came out? It was what I wanted for my fifth birthday. I can still remember asking just for money from everybody so I could go get a Nintendo 64 and play 007. We'd stay up all night playing that video game. It was awesome. And then, of course, Mario Kart came out for that, and that's when all of our controllers broke, and we hated each other. <laughs> Mario Kart was awesome. But what I really loved is we would play cards and we would play darts. And my family was a card-playing family. Um, We would play these Ohio games that uh, some of you don't know, but Euchre is a big Ohio game, Michigan, kind of Midwest game. Uh, We would play Rummy. Uh, We would play all different kinds of games. And we would also play darts. And we would play darts so much that we would wake up the next morning, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, like going bowling or something, and your elbows are sore because you've overextended yourself so many times. And I'm like, man, what's wrong? Oh, we played darts last night till 2 a.m. That's what happened. But we loved playing games. It was so much fun. Well, of course, darts, you've got the main objective of a dart, right? A dart game. And what is that? To hit the bullseye. And other people have different tactics. Maybe you go for 20 points every time, and so you try to hit the 20s. I would would always try to aim for the 20 that's at the middle, and then maybe it would just happen to, you know, fall down right into the bullseye. But the goal wasn't to not hit the dartboard. The goal wasn't to hit the low number on the the dartboard. The goal was to hit the target. And that's what Paul's going to talk to us about. What is the goal of Christian living? What does it mean to hit the target? And you know, as a Christian, basically what Paul's going to get into here is he's saying, look, you've got one job. (laughs) You've got one job. I speak meme. Meme's a big part of my life. I love speaking meme. And so I decided to provide a few pictures for you this morning about this idea of you had one job. Okay, here's the first picture. This is like next level electrical work. Do you see what's happening here? He literally took an outlet and shoved it into another outlet. I do not know how these people survived and the house did not burn, burn down. But the electrician literally had one job, and that was not to kill the people who lived in the house. Here's another picture. Jeff ordered too many hams sale. Jeff, you had one job, and that was not to order too many hams. <laughs> Couldn't pull it off with this equipment. <laughs> Here's another one. Yeah, this is good. You had one job, and that was to not put a faucet above the sink. I mean, can you imagine walking in and turning the water on? Just You know how sometimes you live in your own realm, and nothing registers in your mind? You just turn it on, there it is. You had one job. Here's another one. Delicious cake. It's cheese. (laughs) You had one job, and that was not to put cheese on the printing board, but couldn't pull it off. And then uh, my personal favorite, this item is reduced due to the misspelling of the word bird. (laughs) Wouldn't that be awful if you were the person who created that graphic and you couldn't even spell bird right? You literally had one job, and that was to spell bird right. (laughs) And then this one is my favorite, a love thicker than blood. Man, what a major disaster. I wonder whose fault that was, right? The person who actually wrote out the phrase and said, put this on me. Or the tattoo artist who said, that's what they want. (laughs) You had one job, and that was to spell then, not like then. It was supposed to be van. But Paul was going to write to the church of Philippi, and he's saying, look, you've got one job. And the one job is this, live a life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This word, live your life in a manner worthy, it's literally conduct yourselves in a manner worthy. It was a term that they used to refer to citizenship. And so this church, 
This, this group of people at Philippi, they belonged to what was called a Roman colony. Once Rome kind of took over Macedonia, the uh, region of Philippi, the city of Philippi, became a heavily dominated Roman colony. And so the people at Philippi, they were Roman citizens despite not being in Rome. And a lot of the old soldiers actually, when they retired, they went to Philippi and that's where they lived and that's how they conducted themselves as Roman citizens. And Paul is basically telling the church at Philippi, look, you're citizens as well, but it's not of Rome. It's not of Philippi. It's of the heavenly Jerusalem. You are citizens in the kingdom of God. And here's how citizens in the kingdom of God conduct themselves. Here's how they behave. And so that's what we're going to look at. Now remember, as I said, he's writing to the church at Philippi. They were probably proud Roman citizens. They enjoyed the benefits of being a citizen of Rome. Um, Not everybody was able to speak freely, for instance, as a Roman citizen. Not everybody was able to receive benefits on behalf of the government like Roman citizens. The law worked much different if you were a citizen of Rome compared to a citizen of another nation um, or another nationality. And so Paul is saying, look, you guys know what it's like to be citizens of Rome. But I'm going to tell you what it's like to be a citizen of heaven. Here's how you ought to live your life. Now, how are they going to accomplish that? What is the one job that Paul's going to lay before them? Well, it's simply this. Here's the first thing. Over the next couple weeks, we're going to look at how to do that. But here's the first thing is stand firm. How do I conduct myself as a citizen of heaven? It's going to be standing firm. And the first way that Paul notes that we stand firm is we stand firm together. Unity is what Paul's going to deal with. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. He says, Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. If I could put it in a key idea, it would be simply this. The idea that the Christian life is to be shaped by something of greater value than this world's standards is what runs through the entire New Testament. You see, if you ask the average person out on the street, are you a good person? They would say, yeah. And what are they measuring that according to? Well, probably a worldly standard. I haven't stolen at least a whole lot of money from people, especially poor people. I haven't murdered anyone. Um, You know, I haven't broken up or wrecked any homes or ruined any families. I haven't hurt anybody else other than myself. I just kind of live my life and do my own thing. As long as I don't hurt anybody around me, you know, I feel like that I'm just being a good person. Well, when Paul writes to the church at Philippi, he is saying, look, being a good person isn't good enough. Being a good person isn't our standard, isn't our measure. If we have a target, if we have a bullseye, it is living a life that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, look, I want you to stand firm, but I want you to stand firm together. This idea of standing firm was actually a military term. And being in Rome as a Roman citizen, uh, in other words, they had this great idea, especially they were former Roman uh, soldiers. They had this idea of what it meant to stand firm. Now, the Roman soldiers, they had this tactic that they created. It was almost this turtle shell tactic. And what they would do, the guys in front, they would carry their long shields and they would put it right below their shins. And then the guys behind them would then put their shields on top of the guys in front of them and so on and so forth. And they would have their commanders who would stand in back. And how they had to move was in unity. And one of the worst things that you could do as a Roman soldier at that time was not stand firm. If you were to run away... Uh, rather than standing firm, that meant everyone would be affected because the moment you break one part is the moment everything else starts to fall down. And that's what Paul's telling the church. Stand firm means to stand together. And these Roman soldiers who were probably in the church and certainly at the city of Philippi, they would have known the difficulty of what it meant to stand firm. This is how they would actually approach uh, cities or fortified positions because if you were to shoot an arrow at something like this, good luck. You're not killing anybody. You're not hurting anybody. They were so unified and standing together that they could slay thousands of people in this formation. They could win. Their opponents didn't stand a chance. And that powerful picture, that word image is coming through to the church at Philippi. In the face of opposition and persecution, stand firm together. You know, unity was more important than speed. They didn't move very fast in these kind of positions. 
They moved slow, but they were still together. And I think so often, especially in our culture, we just want to accomplish and get things done. And things don't work out as fast as what we hope they would work out. Things don't change. You don't lose weight too fast. You don't change your character too fast. You don't get a job promotion too fast. I mean, let's face it. Last month, last, the, the last few weeks, we talked about the climb. The climb doesn't happen very fast. The more important thing is standing firm and moving together rather than trying to accomplish our goal. If we lose our unity on the path to our own personal success, nobody wins. And that's what Paul is teaching the church at Philippi. Now, how were they going to stand firm? He says, I want you to contend together in one spirit. It literally is being translated in other ways as one soul, as one person. It's like competing in a team of uh, Olympics, for instance. We watch the Olympics, and we often see individual people get gold medals. And that's great, isn't it? It's fun to watch people get gold medals. But if the United States team loses, we haven't really won. We've achieved something personally, but we haven't achieved something together. And ancient uh, Olympics weren't like what we have today. Nobody got a medal unless the whole team won. Nobody got a crown unless the whole nation won. And that's the way that Paul says, I want you to stand firm. Standing firm together means doing life together, accomplishing one goal. We all get a gold medal if we stay unified. He says with one mind, this means complete harmony, complete purpose, complete coordination, what we think and what we do and how we go about church life, we're all on the same page. And he says, I want you to strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. And he's simply saying this, only in a team effort can you win. Stand firm together. I played football uh, in high school, played basketball in middle school, but I focused on one sport um, when I got to high school. And one of the things that we learned, I really hadn't played organized basketball, you know, as a young man. And so something that our coach taught us is that when we are defending uh, the person with the ball and they go to back to take a shot, we should yell, shot! And he asked us why. And I said, I don't know, to intimidate the other person, like scare them and hope that they mess up their shot. And that wasn't it at all. It was to alert your other teammates that a shot had been made, to help them prepare to get a rebound, a defensive rebound. There's communication so that we can be on the same page. And that's what Paul's saying here. When you work together as a team, you're speaking to one another, encouraging one another, helping one another, and you're doing it together. And so he says, I want you to stand firm together. But they're called not only to stand firm together, but they're also called to stand firm without fear. Look what he says in verse 28. And be not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that it is from God. This word fear, he says, don't be afraid when you stand firm. It's literally kind of like reflexing when you get scared. I can't help myself. I do this to Kyle, our student minister, all the time. It's absolutely hilarious it's just because he has such a sharp reaction and his head and his hair kind of move. And the other staff will tell you that I play games and I joke and I scare them all the time. And it's kind of probably not funny for them, but it's funny for me. I used to do this to a former minister who was here. I mean, he was so jumpy. He would shake every single time. Well, sure enough, I'll creep down the hallway. And sometimes Kyle will even hear me coming. And sometimes his door is even closed and I'm creeping down the hallway or when he first comes in the morning, that's the best because I get here sometimes before him and so he comes through the doors, totally not expecting it. And I'm creeping down the hallway and here he comes. Ah, that's what I do. See, I even got some of you. I knew it would work. I even told you it was coming, but that's what I do. And he just shakes and he just shakes his head. He just can't even say anything to me, but that's what it means. Don't be afraid when your opponents come at you. Don't reflex. The word, I know, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't have done that. That's probably not good. It's like, how did you die? Well, I was in church and I was listening to a sermon and this moron of a preacher decided it would be a good idea to scare the church. And I'm almost 90 years old. Man, that would not be good. Look, I am legitimately sorry. But uh, it's right here in the memory bank. That does not give you a license to scare me, by the way, okay? This is a one-way relationship. <laughs> I'm probably going to regret this. This is true. But here's, they would also use this word of a horse that would get startled and a stampede would happen. Have you ever been in a stampede or have you ever seen a stampede, you know, with the run of the bulls or something like that? People who are nuts. Once one goes, everyone else starts running. 
It only takes one. There have been times where stampedes have happened, like false flag type of stuff, where it was a loud uh, motorcycle or a car, and people will start running because they think there's a gunshot, and people will get trampled. Some people will even get killed. And here's what Paul's saying. When you don't stand firm and you have fear, it causes everything else to run away. It only really takes one and then another and then another. Fear is kind of infectious. And Paul's saying, look, I want you to not only stand firm together, but I want you to stand firm without fear. Be fearless. Now, remember how the problems got started for Paul. He was being opposed by Roman citizens in Philippi when he first went there. In fact, there was this one young lady who was demon-possessed, and she was following Paul. She worshipped Apollos, and she was mocking him and bringing all this attention, and Paul rebuked her and cast that demon out of her. Well, the pagans, the pagan religious leaders, actually turned on Paul, and they became his opponents. They stripped them naked, Paul and Silas. They beat them with rods, and then they threw them in a prison. And Paul's saying, hey, look, you guys know what I went through when I was at Philippi. I know you're going through some of the same things. Stand firm. Don't fear these people. Now, you and I don't know anything what it's like to be physically persecuted like this for the most part. We don't know what it's like to be stripped naked and beaten and thrown in prison. We don't understand that. But that doesn't mean we don't have opponents of the Christian faith. In fact, paganism was one of the strongest opponents for Paul and the Christian faith in the first century for the first church. They threw these people in prison. Nero, who was the Roman emperor at the time, he would actually set Christians on fire in his gardens. He would put them up on uh, crucifix poles, and he would light them on fire, and he would walk his friends through his gardens at night to show how beautiful the flowers were. I mean, these guys were tortured and suffered horrifically. And Paul says, look, I want you to stand firm. Paul actually fought animals in some type of gladiator ring. He actually talks about it. It's possibly where his eyesight was, um, was ruined, or it could have been when, at his conversion when he, when he was blinded by Jesus. But regardless, Paul's saying, look, you guys know what I've been through, and I know what you're going through, and I don't want you to have fear when it comes to facing opposition. I want you to stand firm. Now, for us, we could be persecuted by the government if the certain kinds of people get in power. They could rule this book that we all hold near and dear and the values that it reflects as hate speech, and we could be imprisoned. Paul says, don't fear that. We face people, even in our own state, in our own communities, who preach a certain ideology, a certain naturalism, uh, whether or not you believe in some type of philosophical naturalism or materialism, who thinks that this book is a joke and that it's not historically credible. And so we face opposition on an intellectual level. We face opposition on a social level. How many of you have been in situations where you've wanted to share the gospel, but you don't want to come across like a bigot who hates people? I'm sure a lot of us have been in that same kind of situation. How many of us have been in situations where the exact opposite has happened, where we're afraid of being rejected or unloved or misunderstood, and we're afraid of coming across as somebody who doesn't really believe in Jesus, and we're not really behind this whole gospel thing, and so we don't share the gospel? That is opposition just in a different form. We do have enemies of the cross, and though it might not be physical persecution like they were going through, It could be intellectual persecution, social persecution. And Paul says, look, stand firm. Now, it doesn't mean standing firm ignorantly or standing firm obnoxiously. We don't have to be ignorant and we don't have to be obnoxious, but we are called still to stand firm. And he says, look, this is going to serve as a sign of their destruction and of your salvation. You know, when I watched the Ravens um, play the Titans a few weeks ago, I actually, you know, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, and next week we're going to do Sports Sunday. So even if you don't like football, we still want to encourage you, wear your favorite sports team shirt, whether that's baseball, basketball, college football, hockey, whatever it is, we're just going to have a fun Sports Sunday. But I knew the Ravens were going to lose after watching the first quarter. I mean, you could tell. The Titans were tenacious, They were playing nasty football. The offensive line was pushing the defensive line back almost every single play. They were shutting down the Ravens' offense. I mean, and it was almost easy. And I I said to myself, I said, man, the Ravens are not going to win this football game. The Titans are coming out, and they are just absolutely tenacious. I mean, you can tell. And that's what Paul's saying when you stand firm without fear. People will know who's going to win and who's going to lose. In fact, he says, it's going to serve as a sign from God of their destruction and of your salvation. That's the benefit of standing firm. And look, we're not standing firm on something that is 
foolish or something that doesn't have evidence or something that isn't supported by some of the most brilliant academics in the entire world. We're talking about scientists, philosophers, anthropologists, historians, Christian ministers. We're talking about doctors, some of the most brilliant, intellectually sound people on the known world at this time and throughout history have stood firm on the truth found in the gospel without fear. God's word is good and it is true. And we don't have to fear anything. And so Paul says, look, church, I want you to stand firm. So stand firm together. Stand firm without fear. And then finally, stand firm in the face of persecution. I recently read a story about a minister in Nigeria. Uh, His name was Lawan Adimi, and he was recently beheaded by Boko Haram um, in Nigeria. And they put him on video, of course, Uh, because they wanted him to denounce his faith, and he wouldn't. It just happened this last month. Um, What's happening in Africa is some of the worst Christian persecution that we have seen um, in our lifetime, and it's completely usually ignored by the media, and many of us may not even know what's happening, but people, not just from ISIS, but from all over this Mediterranean world are suffering for their faith. And the Christian Post reported this, despite the situation And Dini said in the video that he was not discouraged because, I quote, all conditions that one finds himself in is in the hand of God. He said, by the grace of God, I will be together with my wife and my children and all of my colleagues. But if the opportunity has not been granted, maybe it is the will of God. I certainly reject the idea that it's God's will for this man or us to be persecuted in this way. I don't think God wills for us to suffer. It's not part of his plan or his design. He may do it by his permissive will. God may permit us to experience evil and suffering for our faith, but I would be hard-pressed to say that it was definitely God's will for this man to suffer in the way that he did. But nevertheless, he stood firm. He stood strong in the face of persecution and opposition. And here's what he went on to say. To die is to be present with the Lord. Isn't that what we read last week? To live is Christ. To die is gain. What a beautiful, fearless warrior for Jesus. Paul goes on to say in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, he says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And as I said, we don't really know what this kind of suffering is like in our 21st century Western world. We don't know what it's like to be persecuted in this way that Paul's talking about. But what he's not talking about under this idea of standing firm together is, well, when people aren't on the same page about the building program in the church, make sure you stand firm together. He's not talking about what if people have a different ministry idea than you, or they think that the church money should be used in a different way than you. You should stand firm in the face of that kind of opposition. That's kind of petty stuff that we deal with in the 21st century because, let's be honest, we're spoiled. In comparison to what the church has gone through and the history of of its existence, we are spoiled rotten. What Paul's talking about, and he's telling the church at Philippi, is when it comes to physical persecution for your faith, stand firm together, stand firm fearlessly, and stand firm right in its face. Here's what Frank Thielman had to write. He says, Paul language was intended to encourage people who stood as a tiny island of commitment to the gospel amid a raging sea of pagan antagonism. These people hated the Christians. And yet Paul says, don't back down. Don't give an inch. Don't grow in fear. Stand together as one unit in unity. Don't run away. Don't cause a stampede. But then he even says this, and this is something that's hard for me to wrap my mind around sometimes. He says, it's actually a gift for you to suffer for Jesus. And he lists two reasons in this passage of scripture. The first reason is this, if successfully endured, it confirms our future salvation. Paul says, this is a sign of your salvation that you have stood firm. It hasn't been easy. It doesn't mean that you haven't questioned your faith or you, you had some internal fear. What he's saying is that it confirms your salvation because you didn't give up even when it was hard. And then look at the second reason. Because we become identified with Christ's suffering. He literally says this, you suffer for his sake. You participate in his suffering. Look what he says in verse 30. 
He says, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Well, hold on. I thought coming to Jesus was about healthy and wealthy and wisdom and that everything was supposed to go downhill from here. Paul says, look, when I first came to you, I was stripped naked, I was beaten, and I was thrown in prison. And things have not changed in 10 years. The gospel doesn't promise to change our circumstances. It promises to change how we deal with our circumstances. The church at Philippi was engaged in this same kind of conflict. Paul went to Rome, thrown in prison. Paul went to Ephesus. He, was, he had a death sentence. He was actually, as I said earlier, thrown in a gladiator ring, and he had to fight wild beasts, and he won. I mean, think about that. He told Corinth this when he was in Ephesus. He says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. He's talking about his time in Ephesus. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Maybe you've been there where you've just, I hate life. Paul says, This is torture, what I'm having to go through. I am in utter despair of life. For those of you who have lost loved ones or have been struck with a disease or have just had hard time after hard time, you can reach this point just like Paul reached where you despair life itself. He says in verse 9, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. No hope for me to live physically. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul says, okay, even if I do die, I'm coming back. I'll stand firm. He delivered us, speaking of God, from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. He's writing this to the church of Corinth. Well, he was in Corinth, and he was afraid of preaching. There were times where Paul was afraid of preaching the truth at Corinth, but yet he stood firm and continued through. You know, Paul isn't talking about in this passage of Scripture suffering in general. He's talking about suffering for Christ. This was God's will for me that I would suffer for Christ. I think one of the biggest mistakes I see people make in the church or even in their understanding of Christianity is they take a Scripture or understanding uh, that we just read and they attempt to apply that to all human suffering as if it's God's will for you to have cancer or if it's God's will for you to go through a divorce or if it's God's will for you to lose a loved one. This isn't God's will. It's not his plan. It's not what he wants. God may permit our suffering. He may permit evil in this world, but it's not part of his divine plan. But the good news is, is the Christian doctrine promises us things, that when we do suffer, God is with us, that God suffered for us on the cross, that God promises to redeem all of our suffering once again, and the new heavens, and the new earth, and that God promises us that our eternal joy will far outweigh any suffering we experience in this life. That is the Christian truth and the perspective on suffering. And these Christians, as I said, saw firsthand what Paul went through at Philippi, and they still said, I want a part of that. That's what I want to experience. Can you imagine watching people suffer like they have in the last 10 years in the Middle East? And still saying, I'm going to become a Christian, burned alive, beheaded, just like our brother that we talked about this morning, their daughters and their wives being raped and murdered, being buried alive, such horrific persecution, and yet the gospel doesn't stop because Christians aren't denying their faith. People don't die for what they know to be a lie. They die for what they believe to be the truth. These Christians believe the truth. Paul believes it's the truth. This church at Philippi is under the same persecution. And Paul says, stand firm. He says, you're engaged in the same kind of conflict. It's an athletic term. He literally says, you're in a wrestling match for your life. Stand firm together. Stand firm without fear. Stand firm in the face of persecution. Why? Isn't that the question we've asked ourselves this morning? Why? Because Paul says, here's the target, here's the goal, here's the arrow that you're pulling back to shoot, and you're trying to hit the bullseye. Live a life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so here's my encouragement to you this morning. First of all, what does it mean to stand firm? Be like the church at Philippi and give sacrificially. This is mission work. Give sacrificially. You know, Paul told the church at Corinth, he says, those who were in Macedonia gave out of their poverty. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 
They didn't give out of a bunch of money. They didn't give out of their excess. They gave sacrificially. We can't do this without you, is what Paul's saying. Look, we're in this together. The church can't move without you. Every person matters. Every gift matters. Every sacrifice matters, whether that's money or your time. Everything matters. And if one of us shrinks back in fear, another one will, and then another one, and then another one. Paul says, stand firm together. Keep giving sacrificially. The second thing that I would encourage you to do this morning is this. Not just give sacrificially, but preach boldly. The church, the church doesn't grow without you. Men is the method by which God grows the church, and that's you. That's you. There's no reason to be afraid. There's no reason to fear. You've got reason, science, history, and wit on your side. You've got God on your side. If you don't know how to preach boldly, study, research, Get some books. Write me an email. I'll give you plenty of recommendations about what it's like to have a reasonable, intellectual, academic faith where you don't have to fear intellectual persecution. Give sacrificially. Preach boldly. And then finally, live fearlessly. Live your life in such a way that you take a stand. You know, all it takes is one person to stand up to a bully. When I was younger, I didn't like bullies. I stood up to him. Now, as a Christian, I still don't like bullies. We'll stand up to him. That's one of the reasons why I love our church leadership so much is because we don't shrink back when it comes to fear. We can stand, but it's because we stand together. And you know, there are students in this room who face academic persecution at school. And what they need is a congregation of people to stand firm with them. You don't have anything to fear. We need to stand for couples in an age of quick and easy, fast divorce. We need to stand for self-sacrificial love in an age of individualism and false freedom. You know, one of the reasons why our, our culture hates marriage so much is because they've got the wrong picture of marriage, and they have this wrong idea of freedom and individualism, and that's more important than self-sacrificial love. Stand for Christian truth in an age of skepticism, atheism, and religious diversity. Just because I believe there is one way, one truth, one life, and the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ doesn't mean I have to be ignorant, and it doesn't mean I have to be a bigot. I can still love people and speak the truth in love and disagree. Stand firm. Stand for self-sacrificial giving and charity in an age of greed. Stand firm. Stand for biblical and scientific sexuality in this age of sexual confusion. I fear what my children are going to be raised in with this culture. There is such confusion of what it means to be a person, the makeup of our DNA and who we are. And it's false, not only false religiously, but false scientifically. We need to take a stand and stand up for what the Bible teaches about male and female, about sex, about who we are and who we're created in the image of. We need to take a stand. We need to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves in this age of death through abortion and assisted suicide. We need to take a stand. It's okay to be pro-life. It's okay to value life in the womb. That's not wrong. You're not a bigot for fighting for the unborn. You're not a bigot for believing that children are inherently created in the image of God and that they have a right to life just like anybody else. We need to take a stand, and it's okay to do that. We need to take a stand for our children who are being sexualized and indoctrinated with lies and deceit. You know that there are actual curriculum available to children without parental consent that teaches them about things that should only be taught by you in the home. There are advertisements on TikTok right now where medical professionals are encouraging 12, 13-year-old girls, you don't need parental consent to get health care as they put it. You don't need your parents. You don't have to tell them. It is your right. It is against the law for you to have to inform your parents about anything to do with your health care and reproductive rights. And they're not dancing in a very good way, as I should say, overly sexual, very uh, seductive. These things are exposed to our children all the time. Snapchat had a filter a few months ago. Love has no age. What does that mean? It's, it's an endorsement of pedophilia. We've got to take a stand, and it's okay to do that. It is okay to stand up for what's right. 
as long as we speak the truth in love. And look, the Christians at Philippi, just like, just like Paul, they were name-called, they were hated against, they were persecuted, they were rejected. That's part of the package. We're called to stand firm. We should stand firm for religious freedom. We should stand for biblical marriage. We should stand for the cross. We should stand for the resurrection. Paul says, stand firm together. Now, there's a great cost in standing firm, as I said. And maybe even some of those of you who are joining us, maybe for the first time, be like, man, the church just is so antagonistic. And that's not true. The church isn't antagonistic. We want to speak the truth in love. Everybody is welcome here. Everybody is encouraged to come. I will wrap my arms around the most opposite person of Christianity you can find, and I will love and speak with them and talk with them and share my perspective and my point of view and my perception on reality. And it's okay to do that. It's okay to stand firm and speak the truth in love. And I'll end with this verse. Paul told the church at Corinth, he says, look, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. This is what happens when you stand firm. He says, we have this treasure in us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body uh, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul says, we suffer so you can live. We are persecuted so that the life that is to be lived in Christ may be found in you. These men suffered horrifically so that we could have the freedom that we have today. They went through a whole lot that you and I probably never will go through, but we should honor them and live for Jesus by standing firm. And so what's the target of Christian living? It's to stand together, to stand fearlessly, to stand in the face of persecution. And what does standing together look like? Sacrificial giving, bold preaching, and fearless living. And on that note, let's stand and let's pray.